This is the city, Los Angeles, California. With a population of three million people, there's always something happening. 1933, the automobile was coming into its own. The 294 men assigned to traffic control processed 11,000 accidents. To handle the problem, the department put together the largest motorcycle police contingent in the world. Today, the department is highly mobile. Los Angeles has less policemen per capita than any other major city in the country. That makes my job a little tougher. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Tuesday, January 9th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Internal Affairs Division, investigative section. The boss is Captain McTie. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. The department's policy is to accept, document, and investigate any allegation of misconduct of an employee received from any source. 8.40 a.m. Two of the department's veteran homicide investigators had been accused of stealing $800. It belonged to a dead man. It was his funeral money. I just talked to the deputy coroner. Complaint was registered there by a woman, Agnes Emerson. Sure doesn't sound like Norm Bivens and Earl Malone to me. I take it you know him. Yes, sir, for a long time now, Captain. The department couldn't find a more honest team. They wouldn't take a toothpick without asking. The way you two are signing off, maybe I better pull you off the case before we get started. No, sir, it's just that we've known him a long time, Skipper. It's a little late in the game for them to start going sour. That's speculation on your part, Gannon. Maybe they have and maybe they haven't. The point is, the allegation's been made. You both know as well as I do, the only way we're going to keep a clean house is by checking every time there's any chance of one of our people going bad. Yes, sir, we understand that. Just kind of shakes you, that's all. Like Joe said, we've known both of them for a long time. Then be happy you're not the chief of police. Sir? You dig out the facts. He makes the decision. The allegation lodged by Agnes Emerson to the coroner's office was sufficient to require the preparation of a personnel complaint, Form 181. 9.30 a.m. We made it official. Okay, I want the investigation thorough and fast. Yes, sir. We've already discussed the investigation strategy. And? Well, if Bivens and Malone are dirty, we're going to need more facts before we can interview them. I called Agnes Emerson a few minutes ago, said she'd be right down. Fine. You can start with Bivens and Malone's record. Yes, sir. See if you know them as well as you think you do. Norm Bivens, appointed sergeant, 1960, 18 years on the job. Married, three children, upper 10 ratings for the last 15 years. Total of 35 commendations, no beefs. I'd call that some background. Yeah, he's everything I thought he was. What about Earl? 15 years on the job, assigned to homicide six years ago. He's been there ever since. Ratings? Upper 10 for the past 12 years. 22 commendations. One of them got him the Medal of Valor. One personnel complaint. Where was the dispo? Unfounded. In fact, it's a beef from the same caper that got him the Medal of Valor. Yeah, how's that? Shootout with a hood named Charlie Bernetti. Malone got him cold in a bank 211. Bernetti alleged excessive force and illegal arrest. Apparently trying to provide himself with a legal defense, huh? What'd they find? One count robbery, kidnapping, and attempted murder. It was a hostage situation. Bernetti shot Malone three times. Malone couldn't fire back because of the hostage. How'd he take him? Played dead. When Bernetti started out the door, Malone got to his feet and cold conked Bernetti with a barrel of his gun. That where the excessive force beef came from? That's where. Sure. Well, what do you think, Joe? About what? Bivens and Malone's packages. Good records, hard-working stiffs, both of them. $800. Doesn't seem worth it to chance blowing retirement and your pension. That's really not that much money. It's been done for less. This is room A, isn't it? Oh, yes, it says A right there on the door. Yes, ma'am. My name's Emerson. I'm here about those two thieving cops. At 
11.05 a.m., the complaining witness, Agnes Emerson, was interviewed. She was informed her conversation would be tape recorded. I watched over Elroy Brown for 10 years. I loved him like a brother. You don't have to be that close, ma'am. Oh, I don't. No, ma'am. Now, what are the circumstances that brought the two detectives to you? Well, they were the first to tell me of Elroy's death. He has no family on the West Coast. I was all he had, just me. Yes, ma'am. How is it the two officers happened to be there? They brought me Elroy's hotel bill. For what reason, ma'am? I took care of all Elroy's business affairs. His veteran's check comes in each month. Elroy signed it over to me, and I paid all his expenses. Elroy wasn't a very good manager. Is that right? I suppose the hotel manager told your policeman that, and they felt they should notify me. Did the officers ask you for Mr. Brown's property? No, sir. I gave it to them. With Elroy gone, there was no need for me to keep it any longer. I asked them to give it to the coroner so Elroy would have a decent burial. One thousand dollars was all that Elroy had in this world. It's all right here. Elroy's account, every entry, every withdrawal, every dime received and paid out is listed right there. Ten years, Sergeant. It took ten years for Elroy to save that money. Take a look at the balance. Take a look. Was the money in cash when you turned it over to the officers? Of course it was. Ten $100 bills. I told all this to the coroner. What other kind of personal property was there, ma'am? Elroy's watch and two rings. They were his prized possessions. I was certain he wanted to be buried wearing them. Anything else? No, I told all this to the coroner when I went in to check on Elroy's funeral arrangements. Yes, ma'am, we understand that. Now, we'd like you to repeat everything to us that you told the coroner. Don't worry, I'll do just that. When I talked to the coroner and he showed me that those officers had only turned in $200 of Elroy's money, I was absolutely shocked. I gave those two police officers $1,000. They helped themselves to 800 of it, and they thought they could pull a fast one by giving a poor old man a cheap $200 burial. Did you count the money in the officer's presence to verify the amount? I did. Ten $100 bills. $1,000 in cash, a poor dead man's life savings. Did the officers have you sign a receipt? Oh, one of them wrote something in a little book. I don't know what it was. Well, now, did the book look like this one, Miss Emerson? knows I guess it might have did you read what he wrote in the book no I just signed it without reading what you signed well I didn't have any reason to those men were police officers I trusted them what is this anyway what are you trying to imply we're not trying to imply anything Miss Emerson we just want to get all the facts straight well you get your facts straight and while you're at it you just might ask around about my reputation I run a good honest business the quick loan company and I have gone out of my way to be helpful Believe me, it's hard to keep even with the boards these days with taxes the way they are and rent going up all the time. Don't you dare question my honesty, Sergeant. Times are tough, but I wouldn't do anything as low as stealing a poor dead man's money. All right, ma'am. Now the receipt. After you signed it, did you see what the officer did with it? Well, I guess he tore the page out and gave it to me. Yes, that's what he did. He tore it right out and he gave it to me. I wonder if we might see that receipt. Well, I threw it away. I didn't think I'd have any use for it. Well, now, why didn't you think so? If you can't trust the police, who can you trust? We briefed the captain on the results of the Agnes Emerson interview. He contacted the commander of Robbery Homicide Division to arrange for the interview of Sergeant Norman Bivens and Officer Earl Malone. 12.30 p.m., the accused officers arrived at Internal Affairs Division. Yeah, I heard you two had taken up headhunting. Well, now, what's this all about? Don't tell me we've got a beat. That's it. Hey, wait a minute. You're serious, aren't you? Complaint came in this morning. What's the allegation? Grand theft. You don't believe it, do you, Joe? Doesn't make any difference what I believe. We've got the case. Bill? Joe's at it, Norm. We've never stolen anything in our lives. Joe, Bill, you know better. Come on, you two. We've known each other a long time. We're friends, remember? And we still are, Norm. We've never questioned your honesty. We've never had any reason to. But right now, none of that makes any difference. Like you, we got a job to do, and it happens to be an investigation involving both of you. All right. We understand. Now, tell us, what's it all about? It's an allegation of grand theft, and it's now focused on the two of you. That's all I can say right now before the interviews. Focus? Just why did you happen to use the word focus, Joe? Sounds kind of legalistic, like Miranda. That's just where we stand, Miranda. That's serious, huh? That's serious. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. 1.35 p.m. Both officers waived their rights and were informed of the distinctions between criminal and administrative inquiry. 
Sergeant Norm Bivens had been waiting in room A for the past hour while we conducted the separate interview with Officer Earl Malone. All right, for the third time, it was 200 that's all, and we gave it to the coroner. Two $100 bills. Did you get a receipt from the coroner? Yes, Norm has it. You say Norm also got a receipt from Agnes Emerson? Yeah, the lady in the poncho. Where's that receipt now? Norm has it. Did you see her write it? She didn't. Norm wrote the receipt. Where did Norm get a receipt book? Oh, now, come on, Joe. You know we don't carry receipt books. Never mind what we know, Earl. Just talk to us. Norm itemized the property and the two $100 bills in his notebook and had her sign it. What did he do with the page she signed? I told you, he has it. Emerson woman says he tore the page out and gave it to her. The other one he gave to her. You just lost me. Come on, Joe. We don't carry carbon paper, right? All right. Okay. Norm wrote two pages in his notebook, itemizing all of the property twice, including the two C-notes. Now, I watched him. Go on. Norm signed one page and had her sign the other page. Now, the one he ripped out and gave to her was the one he signed. Norm kept the one with her signature. All right. Now, what if I told you Agnes Emerson claimed she signed for $1,000, not $200? I'd say she's lying. Maybe. Maybe nothing. She's lying. Look, what are you digging for anyway? I've told you the truth. We've been over this thing a dozen times. I'm getting sick of it. Okay, Earl. That's all for now. You mean I can go? For now. I'd like you to wait out in the lobby till after we've talked to Norm. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Look, I'm sorry I blew up. Forget it, Earl. No, I mean it. I'm sorry. I know you guys got a job to do. It's just that I'm sitting on the wrong side of the table. I've never been a suspect before. Well, that was a long wait. Sorry, took a little longer than we figured. Where's Earl? Did you book him? Nope. He's out in the lobby. I've got to hand it to you two. Play it right to the hilt. No prior information, separate your suspects, keep them waiting a while. What comes next? Good guy, bad guy routine? I guess that's the advantage of policing ourselves, Norm. We know how to do it. We're all experts. Yeah, but that's not what we're here to talk about, is it? Where do we start? At the beginning. Where is it? Friday morning. Let's start when you got to work. Well, there's not too much there. I got in about 8.30, checked the board. Earl came in about five minutes later. We went down to Central Jail to 510 a couple of prisoners. Then over to the DA's office to get a... You know something, Joe? What's that? I got a knot in my stomach as hard as a rock. And when we got back from lunch, we got a DB call over on East 5th. Elderly fellow by the name of Elroy Brown died of a heart attack in one of the hotels. We took the DB report and had him removed by the coroner. Any evidence of foul play? No, routine DB. There was no doctor in attendance and no family, so we turned it over to the coroner and left. All right, what'd you do then? Well, let's see. Oh, the hotel manager mentioned he had a friend that kind of looked out for Brown and managed his bills and whatnot. Asked if we'd notify her and drop his hotel bill off. It was only a few blocks away, so we said okay. The manager give you the friend's name? Yeah, a pawn shop operator. Her name was Emerson, yeah, Agnes Emerson. All right, go ahead. Well, we went over there and dropped the bill off. She was kind of upset about this old fella's death, so we hung around a while and tried to make it a little easier for her, you know. Yeah, go on. She had some of his personal belongings, said she didn't really know what to do with them. I told her they should be turned over to the coroner, they'd make the proper disposition. The old man had a watch, a couple of rings, a little cash, you know. How much cash? Two hundred. She said she'd been saving it for... Wait a minute. Is this what we've been leading up to for the last 20 minutes? Go ahead, Norm. No, sir. I turned the whole works over to the coroner. You check. I've got a receipt that says so. A receipt for $200, right? Right. What's the problem, then? How much money did Agnes Emerson give you? I told you, 200 Did she count it? You bet. In your presence? Right. I know better than to receive property any other way. Then why'd you take it in the first place? Procedure doesn't require that. We were trying to do the lady a favor. She was upset. We were going right by the coroner's office anyway. I offered. Did you give her a receipt? Yeah. I had her sign for it. How'd you work that? I itemized the property and the money on two different pages in my notebook. Had her sign for it. I always do it that way. You give her a copy? I did. I signed one. I had her sign the other one. Which copy did you give her? The one I signed. You keep the one she signed? You bet I did. Okay, let's have a look at it. We can't. Well, now, why is that? Well, I haven't got it. Where is it? I don't know. Suppose you explain that. Look, Joe, this might look bad, but I swear to God it's the truth. I lost it. Where did you lose it? I don't know. Did you tell your partner you lost it? I don't think so. He could have assumed it, maybe. How's that? How could he assume it? Well, he came up to the car when I was just finished scratching around looking for it. Did you tell him what you were looking for? No, I don't think I did. Why didn't you tell him? Because I didn't think it was that important. Other things were happening then. 
What things? Well, after we left the pawn shop on the way to the coroner's office, a robbery went down at a liquor store on Broadway. We heard the call and rolled on it. Earl checked the area on foot. I put out the preliminary broadcast. That's when I missed my notebook, as I got the suspect info from the clerk. I usually write it in my notebook. I couldn't find it, so I used a piece of scratch paper. Did you check your unit thoroughly? Yeah, everything. Front seat, back seat, everywhere. It's just plain gone. That's the truth. How much does this Emerson woman say she gave us? $1,000. She's lying, Joe. She's lying. All right, let's try it again, from the top. Both officers insisted they had received only $200 from the Emerson woman. The stories were consistent. 4.10 p.m., I finished out the day by interviewing the hotel manager and the liquor store clerk. Their statements matched those of the accused officers. Wednesday, January 10th, 9.10 a.m., the captain agreed a re-interview of Agnes Emerson was necessary in the hope we could clear up some of the conflicting statements. I can't imagine what the need is to go over it all again, officer. How many times do I have to tell you? I'd like you to do one more thing for us, ma'am. All right, let's just get it over with. I'd like you to submit to a polygraph examination. Polygraph? What on earth's a polygraph? Some people call it a lie detector. You don't need any gadget to tell you I've told you the truth. I'm telling you. Let me explain, ma'am. Now, I filled you in on what the officers had to say. And as it stands, there doesn't seem to be any way of adequately resolving this case without the polygraph. Have the two officers done it? No, ma'am, not yet. Why not? That's up to the chief to order. Our procedure is to put the complaining witness on first, then the officers. You gonna ask the chief to do it? That depends on the results of your examination, Miss Emerson. Well, I don't mind going first. I don't have anything to hide. One twenty-five p.m., Scientific Investigation Division polygraph expert Lieutenant Cal Beeson examined Agnes Emerson. She's still on the box? Yeah. She's been in there long enough. No, it just seems that way. It's funny. I know we're clean, and yet I slept lousy last night. Whoever said a clear conscience keeps you at ease? Yeah, even my wife noticed. You talk it over with her? Not on your life. When this is over, not till then. Friday, Gannon. See you, man. Cal, how'd you do? She's one in a million, Joe. Take a look at this tape. No response. Cardiac, respiration, skin sensitivity. Not a thing. What's it mean? Is she lying? That's the problem. I can't tell. Like I said, the woman's one in a million. She could be a pathological liar, or she has no feeling about anything. We get them like this, but they're rare. Great. So we're right back where we started. Her story against theirs. Sorry, Joe. I just can't give you a valid interpretation, and I ran her three times. Yeah. Thanks anyway, Cal. I asked her to wait in the outer office. Thanks, Cal. Where do we go from here? I'll check with the chief about putting Bivens and Malone on the machine. Right. Well, one more time. And when we pulled up, we both got out. And when I went into the liquor store, it was gone. All right, now what about the clothes you wore that day? Did you check them? Yes, I've been through them so many times, they're worn out. Well, did you search everything? Maybe you forgot what you wore that day. Joe, I've only got two suits and a sport coat. I've been through them all. What about your shirts? Check the laundry? My wife is the laundry. I've asked her a dozen times. She did all my shirts yesterday and no notebook. Don't what? bother asking. Yes, I checked the clothes hamper. What unit were you driving that day? The blue one, shop 827. Were you driving? No, I was. I always drive. Did you look through the car thoroughly? Yes. Yes, yes, we did. Well, go over it again. Where did you look? Everywhere. The street, inside the liquor store, and the car. Where in the car? You name it, I looked. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, let's do it again. 1.40 p.m. Maybe it was a fool's errand, but I had to be sure. I went downstairs to the police garage. That's it, shop 827, the blue one. Thanks, Mike. Any time.
2 p.m. I immediately took Sergeant Bivens notebook to the crime lab for examination, chemical processing, and photographing. 2.30 p.m. I returned to Internal Affairs Division, interview room D. Bivens and Malone are waiting downstairs. Where'd you turn it? In their unit. If Bivens had tried to hide it, he couldn't have done a better job. Where in the car? Slipped down in the defroster. Where'd you say you found that notebook? Slipped down in the defroster. Should have brought it with you. Huh? Might get a little cold in there. Yeah, go ahead and turn it on, because I'm not going to say anything till you do anyway. Yes, ma'am. I don't trust you either. Now, have those two thieving policemen admitted to stealing that $800 yet? No, ma'am. What have you got in your hand? A complaint. Well, I suppose you want me to sign it. Let me have it. Are you sure you want to sign this complaint? Certainly, I'm sure. Give it to me. Miss Emerson, are you prepared to testify under oath that you gave those two police officers $1,000 instead of $200? Just give me your pen, Sergeant, and I'll show you what I understand. You better let me explain something to you first. Lying under oath or signing a false deposition is perjury. Now, perjury in this case is punishable by imprisonment in the state prison not less than one nor more than 14 years. Now, do you understand that, Miss Emerson? Now, suppose you tell us the truth here. Uh, all right, sir. If you don't want me to use your pen, I'll use my own. There, there's truth for you. You sure you don't want to reconsider, Miss Emerson? No, I don't want to reconsider. All right. Now, these are photostats of pages taken from the officer's notebook. Item one. That's a receipt written by Sergeant Bivens and signed by you. $200, not $1,000. I don't understand. I threw it away. No, ma'am. He wrote two receipts. You signed one, and he gave you the one he signed. <laughs> Item two. Now, that's the one you threw away, Miss Emerson. Our crime lab was able to raise the print-through impressions on the page underneath in the notebook. $200. Not 1,000. Item three of this complaint you just signed. The signatures match. Well, it was rightfully mine. I kept that money because Elroy would have wanted me to have it. How do you know that, ma'am? Well, he just would have, that's all. He would have willed it to me. I know he would, but he died before he could write one. So you just took 800 of that 1,000, is that it? Sure, I did. I deserved that money. After all I did for that old man, I deserved it. It was rightfully mine. I'm not ashamed to tell that to the whole world. Fine. Suppose you start with those two police officers. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, the investigation report was forwarded to Captain Hugh Brown, Commander Robbery Homicide Division, for his review and recommendation. In a moment, the result. The Commander of Robbery Homicide Division recommended to the Chief of Police that the allegation of theft be classified as unfounded. Thank you.